Hey, it's Bob Wormsley from Insidium, and in this free tutorial, we're going to look at recreating this underwater bubbles scene. So we've got this really nice plunging of an object into some water, and then we have the dispersion of those bubbles, and they kind of float around the place before they start rising upwards towards the surface. So actually a relatively simple technique, but a very, very impressive result. Let's jump into Cinema 4D and rebuild it. OK, so let's bring in an X-Particle system into our scene, and what we'll need is a dynamic object. Now, we're not going to use a fluid FX solver to make these fluids and bubbles. We're going to actually just use an explosion to add vect particles, and that's going to give a feeling of liquid. So in the Dynamics menu, let's go to an Explosion FX, which brings in our domain. Now, we're not going to be rendering this explosion, so we don't need particularly high resolution in our sim. So to reduce that resolution, we increase the voxel size to, say, 5. So by increasing the voxel size, there's fewer voxels in the container, meaning it's a, it'll sit much more quickly but won't be as detailed. But for our advection, it's going to work fine. Right, so now we need an object from which we will admit... Uh, um, emit our particles and this is going to be as if an object has fallen and sploshed into a big pool so the object we're going to use is let's just use a text spline and we'll just do a capital x um, i'll use just the default um, uh, text um, font but i'll make it bold and let's align it in the middle Okay, good. Oops. So let's put that inside a extrude object. So I'm going to hold Alt, and go to my menu, NURBS menu, and pick an extrude. So there's our extrude. Very good. Maybe make it 40. Um, so I'm just going to um, activate my exposure again to see its bounding box. So this X is way too big. Um, let's just go to the text and the height, put it from 200 to say 50 or 60. 60 will do. Yeah, that looks better. Okay. So now what we want to do is emit particles from this object. And you can't emit directly from an extrude object. So what we need to do is place this inside a connect. So hold Alt, go to this menu, and we'll pick a connect. And it automatically makes it a child of this connect object. And um, we don't need to weld those points. There we go. So I'm just going to hide this X particles icon here. Um, in the viewport that comes in as part of the system object but I, I don't want that to get in the way of, of what I'm looking at so just go to icon and viewport and disable it right so just finally we're going to want to animate this X and and that might be a bit easier if I put this connect inside a null object so I'm going to hit alt again and hold it go to my object list and pick a null and what we want to do is we want to be rotating this in the animation, but the axis origin point here is at the world origin, which is at the foot of the object here. And we really want it in the center, because if I try rotating this, it's, it's getting funky rotation because it's rotating it from that um, point, which is not what we want. So all you need to do is go to the null. Now, I could do this perfectly. Um, and accurately, but I'm just going to eyeball it in the perspective view. So let's hit the axis tool and we'll move that axis point to the middle. Okay, good. So now when we rotate, it's doing it kind of from the center of the object. Very good. Okay, so what do we need to do now? Let's animate this down. We're just going to keyframe it really simply. So we'll start with it outside of our domain on frame zero. So let's go to the null coordinate. Hit the keyframe on the Y, which is where we've just moved it. And then we'll hit a keyframe on all of these rotational amounts. And then we'll just play it through to say, I don't know, maybe there. We can make adjustments should we need to. And we're going to plop it down into our water, say here. So put a keyframe on the Y. And let's just put some random amounts in this rotation. There we go, something like that. Hit keyframes on those. So now if we hit play, we've got our X falling down. And we've actually got, we've got an ease in and an ease out 
of this animation. And that's because by default, we get a, a Bezier interpolated curves between um, keyframes. So to get that so it's just falling straight down without that ease in and ease out, we'll just go to, um, let's go to the window. We'll go to the timeline dope sheet. Let's just select all keyframes and hit, by default, it's on Bezier here, spline. So if we stick it to linear, and now we should just get just falling down straight. Okay. Excellent. I've got a feeling our um, we've gone a bit too crazy on this rotation. I think it's rotating too much. I'm going to put that on 120 instead. This one on 90. And this one on, I don't know, 132 is a good number. Right. Excellent. There we go. And I think we can maybe move a little bit more quickly. So let's just get that keyframe and bring it in. Vroom. Good. Right, so that'll do. Again, we can make adjustments should we wish. This will remain completely parametric, so we're not locked into anything. Great. So what do we need to do? We need to emit particles from our new X object, um, and we'll use this emitter. So the way we'll do that is we'll go to the object tab of the emitter and in the emitter shape we'll change it from the default rectangle to object. And then we can drag in our null object and now we've got particles being spat out from the X and they're being emitted from the polygon center. So we don't want that. Let's emit it from the edges there we go that looks better and they've got initial speed which we don't want them to have any speed so let's just put that speed down to zero so now they're emitting so we don't want them to emit on every frame we want them to kind of plop down so we're going to want them to emit when the x gets to about this point so let's just see when that is about there so maybe frame 10 so let's go to the emitter emission in the emission tab we will say uncheck emit on all frames we will start emitting on frame 10 and let's emit for um i don't know maybe five seconds there we go and bush there's our particles and we want them to die off because these are the particles which are going to emit the fuel which will be ignited by the exposure effects which will light. So we don't want them emitting fuel continually, um, otherwise we're just going to constantly have an explosion and the advection is not going to work. So we just want to give them quite a short lifespan, maybe 10 frames, give it a variation of three and there we go and then they disappear. Okay, looking good. So the last thing is they, they have no movement at all. And what we want them to do is we want them to inherit the, mo the motion of our object falling down. So the way we do that is in the motion inheritance quick tab in the emitter. So let's just activate that and let's see the difference. And there we go. So they're falling down with this object. Excellent. So now what we want to do is we want to light, ignite those particles. So to do that, we need to do a couple of things. We need to give them a fuel value and then give them a tag so they can talk to this Explosure Effect solver. So let's give them the fuel. We'll go to the Extended Data tab of the emitter and we'll go to the Physical Data tab and we'll give it, I don't know, let's say three fuel. Let's see what happens. Nothing. And that's because although the particles contain fuel, they're not able to communicate and tell Explosure Effects that they've got it. So let's give them a tag. We'll go to the tags, X particles tags, Explosure FX source. So now we should get an explosion. There we go. And then it's floating upwards. We're not getting an awful lot of, of fire. And that is because if we go to the Explosure Effects, our voxel size is five centimeters and we can see that as depicted by this grid at the back and our particle size which is carrying the fuel let's go to the emission tab emission tab the particle size is only three centimeters so it isn't um, able to be seen all of the time because it's too small by the voxel size of five centimeters so if i increase this up to say eight we should get a lot more fuel. 
There we go. That's looking way better. Right. So we're kind of starting to see what's happening here. The fuel's getting pushed down, which will be our bubbles, and then it's starting to rise. And you imagine if, if particles were thrown, uh, kind of or oxygen particles were pushed down into a water body, they'd get so far down, and then they'd start uh, rising upwards to the surface. So we're kind of getting the motion we want, but they're perhaps rising, it's rising slightly too quickly. So let's arrest this upward motion slightly. We'll go to the Exposure FX um, object. Let's go to the Simulation tab. And what we will do, I'm going to reduce the gravity amount, which is slightly counterintuitive, because by reducing gravity, what you're doing is you're reducing the overall strength of these three buoyancy amounts. So you can see now that it's rising up more slowly because the buoyancy is now kicking into gear, but we have given it a lower buoyancy amount by reducing the gravity. So think of this gravity slider as a multiplier for these three buoyancy amounts. The lower this number, the less effect the buoyancy will have on the sim. The higher the number, the more quick, the more effect the buoyancy will have. So it's almost like a strength slider for this buoyancy. I'll put it down to say three, two or three. Let's have a look. All right, so that's looking quite good. Um, I think I could just bring this domain down a little bit. We don't want any clipping at the bottom. That's looking good. Right, so that's the simulation. So now what we want to do is we want to admit more particles and these are going to make our bubbles in the end. So what we could do is let's just, I'll press pause, we'll copy this emitter by holding control and dragging it and we'll get rid of the tag on this one because we don't want to emit any more fuel and let's Let's put the display, just for now, so we can see what's happening, we'll make the display circles and we'll make it a blue colour. Okay, so now we've got these blue particles going down and you can see that they're disappearing straight away because we set the life of our initial ones to be very short and we actually want these to stick around forever. So let's go to the new emitter. Let's rename this so we can be organised. We'll call this uh, Bubbles. Let's go to this emitter and we want full lifespan and we want these to emit after, slightly after that um, explosion particles. So let's put them on, I don't know, say 15 cent uh, frame and end emit on, we want quite a short, sharp blast of them really. So let's make it maybe 18. Okay, and I'm going to put the birth rate down for now just while we have a look. So there we go. So there's a couple of things wrong. They're not floating upwards like bubbles. And that's because this explosion's having no effect on them yet because we haven't set it to advect any particles. So if we go to Exposure FX and we go to the Advection tab, we can activate it. And we don't need to... These are all of the different bits of information that Exposure FX generates. And then... In the Advection tab, it's going to pass on this information into the particles. So we don't need to pass on any smoke data, any burn data, any temperature. We need velocity, because that's what's going to move them around. So we will pass that on, but we don't need colour or UV. And let's press play and see what happens. Ah, interesting. So something's starting to happen, isn't it? We're getting a bit of Advection, but our explosion seems to have stopped it was coming all the way down here so what's gone wrong well it's this because we've activated advection it's actually advecting the original fuel particles as well as the bubbles and because it's advecting those fuel particles they're not able to follow that motion down here that they used to so what we need to do is um, disclude the emitter fuel particles from being advected. We don't want them to be advected by the smoke. So it's dead easy to do that. All we need to do is go to this emitter that we want to exclude, go to the modifiers tab, and under exclusion, drag in 
the explosion effects. And now we've got our simulation back. And if we make that invisible, here are our bubbles. There we go. That's looking good. Now also, I don't think I want any motion, uh, motion inheritance on these bubbles. Um, I just want them to be affected by the fluid and not by the object from which they're emitting. So I'm going to switch that off. Let's see what happens. Okay. And we could try giving them... Let's give them a little bit of, of their own speed so they dissipate a little. All right. So now they're kind of separated out into their own entities a little. So that's looking good. Okay. So let's just make the emission particles invisible. So now we're not going to render, render them as huge bubbles. We, we want to render lots of, uh, we want to simulate lots of tiny particles and then we're going to mesh those and that's what we'll render. So we'll put our display view back to dots and we'll put the emission amount way up. What do we want? Um, I would say let's try 50,000 per second. There we go, that's our bubbles. So you, you can see the effect already, can't you? As soon as we start creating more particles, we're getting this fluid-like bubbly effect. That's looking quite nice. So I'm going to keep it on 50,000. Of course, this will remain um, parametric and procedural, so we can up those should we need to later. Great. So that's the start. You, you, you can see the feel of our simulation is looking good. So now what we need to do is mesh these particles, and we'll do that using the Open VDB Mesher. So let's go to Generators, and in the menu we'll pick Open VDB Mesher. There it is. Let's bring this up a bit. So the Open VDB Mesher requires a source. What do you want to mesh? So let's drag in our bubbles emitter. And we have this huge blob of, but uh, of bubbles. So what's happened is each individual particle has been meshed. And the detail of that mesh is defined by a couple of things, by the voxel size and the point radius. Now, if I just press ND to reveal the lines, the voxel size dictates how many polygons there are. And at the moment, if I whack this right up, you see there's fewer polygons making up the mesh, which will make a less detailed mesh. Um, and if we reduce that voxel size down, you get more polygons. And then the point radius, if you imagine a radius being drawn around each particle, that's what the point radius works as. And so at the moment, the point radius is 10, which is too big. If we reduce this, it's getting far closer to the actual radius of the particle. So I put that down to 1. And let's just reduce the polygon size. So now we're kind of getting this live mesh developing like this. And it's starting to look a little bit more bubble-like. Now we need more detail because it's, it's too blobby. If we imagine our, our camera angle and position is going to be kind of like this. Whoosh. Let's just bring that up. So it's going to be maybe like that. Splosh. And it's too blobby. We need to see a bit more detail of our individual particles. So what we could do, the point radius is set to 1, and they're still quite big. So we could go down into fractional amounts here. I could say 0.5, then it's disappeared because we don't have enough um, polygon information with the voxel size is great. If we reduce that down, then it appears again. But we're starting to get into very fractional amounts here. So instead of doing 0.5, let's leave that on, when I could leave it on the default 3, and let's make the particles themselves have a smaller radius. So let's go to the bubbles, emission, particle radius is set to 8. So let's stick them back down to the default of 3. And now we've got much smaller bubbles and particles. OK, so I think we could go um, even more detailed. So to get more detail, let's reduce the point radius. Let's go one more. Now they've disappeared because the voxel size is just too big to be able to wrap around with a point radius that small. Let's put this down to two. 
there. So now we're starting to get kind of individual bubbles. Um, let's have a look. And there they go. And then they're going to float upwards. So that's kind of looking okay. Let's just hide those lines, NA. So we've got some blobby bits where those bubbles have joined together, and then we've got lots of bubbles coming up. So I think that's looking okay. I think this, this will probably do us for now. So I'll just make my original object invisible. Let's just get an idea of how this is flowing. Whoosh. And then it then begins to float upwards as the bubbles get drawn to the surface. So I think that's looking pretty good. Excellent. So that'll do. So we're going to start rendering this in cycles in a minute. But before I do, it'll be a good idea. Let's get this cached. And then in cycles, you can work um, much more freely because it's not having to um, work out this simulation frame by frame. It means you can scrub and go to whatever frame you want and it'll work much better. So I'm going to go to um, other objects and I'm going to go to, um, what do I want? I want a cache object. And the cache object, I'd always advise you when I'm working myself on projects, I will always cache to external files. And what this does, it writes kind of a cache, a bit like an image sequence when you're rendering, but a cache sequence to a folder that you define on your hard drive. And then it reads each file back from that, depending on which frame you're on. And this is definitely the best way to work. Um, what I'm going to do in this instance is use the quick method of caching internally. And what that does, it's, instead of writing to individual files, it saves the cache data uh, to memory, and then it saves it as part of the Cinema 4D scene file. Um, so this is a really quick way of doing it. Um, there's no faff of having to have separate folders with cache sequences, but... It means that your scene files get massive, especially if you're doing exposure effects sims. They, you know, some caches could be over 100 gig in some instances. So obviously it's not um, a sensible way of, of working in that instance. But for small sims, some particle sims where there isn't much kind of fluid calculations going on or dynamics, then it's okay caching internally. And for speed's sake in this tutorial, that's what I'm going to do. So let's just click on that. Go to to the beginning, hit build cache. And you can see this is caching through relatively quickly. Um, we're going through to 90 frames. Um, it's already halfway and we've only been going for 10 seconds. So it's going to be about a, a what, 30 second cache uh, to get this completed. And if you're doing this for real in production, you might want to put some more frames on the timeline and have these bubbles um, going until they're completely dispersed but for now this is going to work so what i'm going to do actually i've, I've cached everything um because it gives us a bit, of, a bit of flexibility but now the bubbles emitter has been cached that's kind of been baked and the open vdb mesh has been baked i can actually just switch off the exposure effects sim and i can switch off the emission emitter as well so now we've just got our mesh which we can scrub back and forth, and that's great. And that's obviously running really nicely in the viewport, and there are our bubbles. So a pretty simple setup to get this underwater bubbles effect. So what I'll do is we'll take this scene and we'll go into our Cycles 4D view, and I'll show you how we'll quit, uh, set up a very, very fast um, and quick render, which is going to look nice and realistic at the same time. So here we are in our Cycles 4D uh, setup, and I've got my viewport here in this section. Here's my node editor here for my Cycles 4D materials, and here is the real-time preview, and if I hit play on that, nothing is going to render because we don't have any lights in the scene to illuminate anything. So let's just sort that out first. Um, I'll just leave that rendering. So it's whirring away constantly. Right, so I'm going to use um, objects to light this scene. In fact, we're going to use one object. And let's bring in a plane. So here's a plane in the scene. And we want to give it a light material. So it's emitting light. So let's go to Create, Cycles 4D. And we'll make a surface shader. And we'll make that a emission. 
shader. So click on that. So here it appears in our node editor. Here's the emission node going into the surface of the output. So let's drag that onto our open VDB mesher. Oh, that's wrong. No, <laughs> we don't want to make the uh, bubbles an object. We'll move that onto our plane. So we've got some, and then straight away you can see we've got some um, lighting from above. And it's it's rendering the open VDB mesh, even though there's no material on that. It kind of just renders this grey clay look, very flat, diffuse looking default material. But we can see it's working. So what we want to do, let's just take this plane and we'll just raise it up. Because we're going to have it above our object. So that's the kind of lighting that we want. You think about bubbles underwater, the light source is going to always be coming from above. So this is going to work. And we're going to get a pretty decent look from just one light. Now, obviously, you can be more sophisticated with this. You can put extra lights in. You can change the colors and, and do all sorts of cool things. But for us, let's just keep it simple. We're going to have one light. So in that emission um, node, I'm just going to change the colour. So you can just change the colour here, obviously, but I like to use the Attribute Manager to change it. And then we can change colours in real time and it'll it'll um, respect that in the viewport. So what I'm going to do, I don't, I don't want actually any colour value. I want it almost white. Um, so let's just put that on 99.9. .9. And we can give it a little bit more strength. Let's just say 5. So there is our basic lighting for our splash. Um, there it is. And there are our bubbles. So obviously we don't want it to be this diffuse material. We want it to be a transparent water-like material. So I'm going to show you how to do this just with the most basic setup you can think of in Cycles. We're going to use one node. So let's go to Create, Cycles 4D, Surface, and we've got a glass uh, material which again is only one node, and let's put that onto our open VDB mesher. And you can see uh, we're kind of getting there. It's not quite right yet, but it's looking a little better. So what's happening here is we're getting this transparent material and it's kind of reflecting that um, uh, object and it's kind of refracting the light and it's, it's kind of working, but it's looking very black and very dark. And that's because by default, we haven't instructed the rays to kind of bounce around multiple times. It's just going in once. So the way we sort that out is in the render settings. So if I bring up my render settings here, let's pop it there. Let's go down and we need to go to the light paths and ray depth section. And here we have got all these different settings and one of you might think that the most important one for getting light to be, behave correctly with transparent materials is this first one, the min and max transparency depth, which by default is set to eight. But this is not going to work unless you change the max ray bounces. Because at the moment we can only get one bounce. All right. So no matter how much transparency depth we've got, the rays are only going to bounce once. So if I whack that right up to 28, it makes no difference whatsoever. Or if I put it right down to 3, it looks exactly the same. And that's because it is exactly the same. Nothing's changed because it's only bouncing once. But if I then increase this to, say, 2, you're going to see this suddenly light up when I hit Enter. OK, so it's bounced twice, and now we're getting more uh, light uh, bouncing around the place. Let's put it up to three, and we're getting more. And at up to five. There we go. And we could go up to eight, and now we're taking into account all eight of this max transparency depth. And it's looking much more like bubbles, isn't it? Um, I'm not sure eight is quite necessary. Let's just go back down to, say, five. All right, so that... As a, without doing anything apart from altering how many ray bounces are, suddenly this default glass material is looking pretty decent. So I'll just come out of there. So what might we want to do? Well, the only thing I think I'd, I'd, I'd be inclined to do would be to change the index of refraction from the default. Now, 
you could probably, I'm sure you could Google what would be an appropriate index of refraction when doing a, a, a transparent material of, of oxygen bubbles underwater. Um, but I'm too lazy for that, so I'm just going to, I'm going to put a water value. 1.333 and just leave it at that but I'm sure you could be more accurate and get a better number um, if you uh, if you googled what that should be so I'm going to leave that at that for now and that's looking pretty decent um, let's just move to another frame I mean arguably we could perhaps increase the strength of our uh, uh, plane up to say at an 08 which will make a bit of a difference but I think that's looking that's not looking too bad so before we get on to rendering this let's just um, finalize our camera position and angle and we could perhaps include the slightest bit of uh, blur to suggest some depth of field just to give it a little bit more more depth so what we'll do is let's go to the cycles menu here and bring in a cycles camera which comes into our scene we'll activate that camera and what we need to do is pick a focal distance so click on the camera go to the object tab and we've got this focus distance picker so if I click that I can pick any part of this mesh and we don't see anything yet because we haven't enabled any, uh, we, we haven't kind of given it uh, any kind of depth of field. So in the Cycles 4D tag, let's go to the depth of field setting here and we'll increase this radius of our aperture to, well, let's just slide it up a bit. If we put it up loads, you'll see it happening more obviously and then we can make some adjustments. Now, um, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to make this a bit bigger. And I'm going to increase the size just so we can see a bit more of this. Right, that's going to be easier to judge. Okay, so obviously way too much, um, way too shallow a depth of field with that radius size. Let's bring this way down. So maybe something like, something like that. Let's try another frame. Maybe even less. All right, so there, those are our bubbles. I'm happy with that camera position and with that level of uh, blur in the depth of field. So the last thing before we'd kind of go and actually render out a sequence is you can get, a, you can kind of get a, a good guesstimate of how many samples you're going to need to be able to get a clean render by using the real-time preview. So at the moment, I've got this set to 10 samples, which is rendering very quickly, but we've got lots of space speckly noise in lots of these areas so I know that we're going to need at least 30 uh, just from experience with these things we're going to need at least 30 now bear in mind um, when you increase your samples the time it takes to render increases exponentially because even though you're, you can increase the samples by one say from 29 to 30 samples it's actually much more than that the way in which the samples are worked out I think it's, it's times by four so every time you increase it by one sample you're actually timesing it by four for the, for the render time so this is chugging away. Um, this is done at 30 samples. So that obviously is looking much, much cleaner, isn't it? Um, but I think we could perhaps have a slightly better quality. So let's go up to, say, 35. And this is going to take obviously longer to render, but should be a lot cleaner. And we can see here are the uh, amount of samples it's taking. And it's chugging through them relatively quickly. So at a guess, I'm saying that this is going to be about 45 seconds per frame. So for a highly uh, kind of reflective um, scene with refraction and all kinds of stuff going on, that's not too bad for this quality. And you can see as those samples have progressed, Again, it's a much sharper, much cleaner, much less noisy uh, image. Okay, so that's looking pretty good. So let's just render out a sequence. Let's pause that real-time preview.
and we'll go to let's go to the render settings and i'll just make this bigger so we can see what's going on so i'm going to make sure that i'm using cuda as the render method and i'm using my two 1080 ti's to render then what we need to do is we need to match this sample amount that we did in the real-time preview. We, I decided that 35 was a good amount. So I need, then need to go to the samples section and match that. So let's put 35. And we can leave everything else as it was, and that's going to work fine. So then um, I'm not going to bother saving it. So I'll uncheck that save and... Um, let's go to output and we'll output um, all frames and in fact I think it starts at about frame 10 so let's just uh, let's just render it from there frame 10 that looks good okay so let's come out of that and I will hit render to picture viewer yeah so here it comes and again this is going to be when we get into the animation proper anywhere between kind of 25 seconds a frame for the earlier ones right up to maybe 45 50 seconds per frame so i'll leave this chugging away and then once it's finished i'll come back to you tell you how long it took and we'll play it through so here's our finished render this took uh, just uh, under 23 minutes it's only rendered at 720p obviously but um, it's looking pretty nice so we've got this splash of water into our scene and then the gradual rise up as our oxygen floats to the surface um, and that's looking pretty nice and remember that we set this up and, and simulated this in very very quick time the rendering is one light um, which is creating this look so a very quick and easy setup and for a nice result so obviously if you spend more time in your simulation time and, and render it at a higher detail and you could be um, much more savvy with your lighting and scene setup um, you're going to get much nicer results but I hope that demonstrates the ease of which we can set up what looks like a really nice realistic underwater bubble scene So as you can see, a really powerful but quick and easy to set up technique. Don't forget to subscribe to us on YouTube and then you'll get all of the latest free tutorials when we release them. There's a ton of other videos on there as well, including quick tips from Mario. So until next time, I'll see you later.